All right? Now, angels, biblically, is just a, a category. All right? It's a category of being uh, that inhabit most of the time a realm we cannot see. All right? uh, someone has called it the unseen realm. All right? we, we see certain things, and then there's certain things we do not see. We see the outcome. We see kind of what, what it causes, but we don't have immediate access. And so what the Bible teaches us, and we've talked about this before, is that God, just like God makes the animals, and there's the animal kingdom, and just like God makes us human beings in his image, so he has created these supernatural, maybe uh, outside of or above the earth, beings that we call angels. All right? there, there's apparently multiple categories of these beings, and we, we don't... We don't fully understand it all, but it's certainly in there. Right? There's the seraphim. There's the cherubim. It talks about archangels, like the messengers of God. Right? And that's the term angel really just means messenger. All right? And so uh, apparently some of these beings uh, appear in human form. And so they bring messages to the people. They bring messages to people in the Old Testament. They bring messages uh, to people like Mary in the New Testament. Right? An angel appears to her, tells her she's going to bear a child and should name him Jesus, and he is going to save the people from their sins. Right? So that at times, the angels simply are messengers. But again, as we read through the text and we're careful in our observation, we're like, okay, the seraphim are showing up in Isaiah 6, and they are these six-winged fiery ones. Right? And it has to do with purity, and it has to do with brightness. Interesting. The cherubim, they're guarding the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. They're God's honor guards, so to speak. Right? They show up in different places where God, His throne is seen, and these beings uh, are responsible, apparently, for worship. They're responsible for magnifying the glory of God. We, we don't get a full picture of the hierarchy of these angels, but we know they exist. Now, what the text also tells us, and we see in Revelation 12, that a third of these beings apparently rebelled against God's rule. Led by the, the head of that group, Lucifer, they decided that they would make themselves equal with God and they would rebel against his rule. Is that what he's talking about? Is, he, is, is that the moment Peter references? Well, let's, let's keep reading. It says, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, all right, that heavenly rebellion might be in mind. Some scholars believe it is. But, oh, he goes on, cast them into Hell, the word there literally is Tartarus, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Doesn't seem like the, the fallen angels right now are all chained. It seems, as a matter of fact, from Jesus' ministry that they're very active. All right? So, huh, interesting. So, who are these angels? Well, Peter immediately then jumps to the flood. So it's angels that sinned in the time of Noah. Who are those angels? Jude, who is a parallel actually to the book of Peter, like 2 Peter and Jude are always, if you look at commentaries, they always are 2 Peter and Jude. They, they apparently either borrowed from each other or had a third uh, kind of external source that both, Jude and Peter drew from. Jude said that this way. He says, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of that great day. Huh. What is he talking about? Well, what, he's what he is talking about, most scholars believe, is an event that we find very disturbing, all right? Uh, it's, it's one of those Old Testament oddities. When we read it, we go, uh, not sure what to do with it. Not sure. I want to know, all right? Let me, let me read it to you, all right? Since we're in Second Peter, I mean, what, what better thing do you have to do than read 
some crazy Old Testament text. Here it is. When man began to multiply, I'm reading out of Genesis chapter 6, first four, four verses. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Now, that text has been interpreted in a couple of different ways. All right, one uh, is that these sons of God simply are the ancient kings uh, that have, you know, marital relations with common folk. And so then there's like uh, these rulers, these other mighty men that come from that line. Almost no one believes that that's even remotely close. So let's just do away with that for a moment. The, the second interpretation, and that is uh, kind of in our more naturalistic world, right, where we're like, the supernatural is freaky, let's rule that out. Uh, the interpretation that's often given, and this is, for example, Matthew Henry would be one of the people that interpreted it that way, is that the sons of God simply is the, the men from the godly line of Seth. Right? Adam and Eve had children. It was first Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel, and then Cain, is, that is the cursed line. And then Seth was born, who would be the godly line. That right? is the line from whom the Messiah should come. It, and, and so there, okay, great. These are the, the sons of the line of Seth, the godly line. So these are the sons of God. And they're marrying women who are from the line of Cain. It's a, it's a very popular and very naturalistic explanation of the text. A third interpretation, and this is uh, what I think Peter is hinting at. This is what Jude is hinting at. This is the belief of Judaism during the time of Jesus. It's the belief that really extended well into the second century. Only after the second century do we see uh, this Sethite interpretation and that's the interpretation that the sons of God are exactly what Job 1, verse 6, Job 2, verse 1, and Job 38, verse 7 are claiming that they are. The sons of God are angelic beings who for some reason, and we don't fully understand the details, and maybe uh, it's a bit much for one sermon, for some reason decided that they would mate with human beings, and it's, doesn't it sound crazy? It sounds a little crazy. But man, it's in the Bible. What do you do with that, right? Uh, this summer, we're doing a, a sermon series on all the questions you asked, and we're going to actually take a look at some of these crazy things that are in the Bible. Peter, Jude, first century Jews, and, and, and most of the church fathers all the way up to probably around uh, 400 A.D., believe that this is what the text said, that the angels did not stay within their realm of authority. The angels left that realm, and according to what Jude says, just like the people of Sodom who are engaging in sexual sin, these angels engaged in sexual sins. Wow. And they married human women, and they had offspring, and these, this offspring was the Nephilim. And that Hebrew word simply means the giants. Whoa! This is what Peter is talking about. It's like, this is a crazy event in history. It was wrong, it was sinful, it was wicked, right? We, I don't have enough time to fully explain why uh, scholars believe this took place and what the goal of these evil angels was, all right? Like, we're, we're probably going to talk a little bit about that this summer in our special Curiosity and Courage series. 
But what we do know is that God was not letting it stand. And so it says that God came and, and Peter says he confined them. He imprisoned them in gloomy darkness, pits of gloomy darkness. The actual word there is he tartarized them. He committed them to Tartarus. Now Tartarus in Greek understanding, and this is what Peter is writing into, right? It was the lowest level of hell. It was even be below Hades. And it was, according to Greek mythology, where gods and monsters were imprisoned for the judgment. I think this is very much what Peter is saying. The sons of God, these angelic beings who fell into sin, were put into chains of gloomy darkness and kept for judgment. God is very much able and very much willing to judge. So he judges angels who are higher than human beings, who are more glorious, the Bible tells us, on multiple occasions than human beings. What else does he judge? He judges the ancient world. So this is the first one is God did not spare the angels. No matter how glorious, no matter how beautiful, no matter how special a creation they were, he cast them into hell, committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to keep them for judgment. He goes on. Now, now I know some of you are like, wait, 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 wait. To tell me, what, what is happening? This summer, we're going to take a look at Old Testament oddities. I think that, that's the title uh, that Bella has given that particular sermon. And so we're going to take a look at this uh, during the summer. So if you want to know more, there's more. If you want to want some book recommendations, we can provide those as well.